Good. Uh, right. So, hi, hi, Laura. Hi, Holly. Hello. Thanks for uh, coming along and uh, joining me in a bit of a chat in the group tonight. So, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome along. Um, so, uh, I'll let Holly start the story, really. But just to let everybody know, we've got these three words, obviously, safety, freedom and connection. Uh, what we realized when we started doing them as part of our joint workshop, and I'll make sure that the um, information for the workshops in the thread and also as a separate post as well. Uh, so anybody who wants to come in, because uh, you can still have access to it, but it was pretty clear that actually these are huge topics. And uh, obviously tonight we're not going to be able to really deep dive on, on any of them, but just to give you a flavor of some of the kind of points that we that came up in our joint conversation and having our three individual filters look at it really. So Holly, uh, you um, came to Laura and I and uh, kind of muted the idea of us doing this joint workshop and, and getting all through this in. Uh, and you came up with these three words, which I, I, is, 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 is I'm genius really, because obviously they're really important. Um, tell, so tell us a little bit about why you thought about doing this and getting these, uh, these kind of three topics together. Yeah, so I think as concepts, like you say, they're huge. <laughs> they go on and on and on. Um, but I do feel like, and I think you two agree, that they are the most crucial concepts when it comes to relating to our dogs, understanding their internal world, and also making their external world a safe place to be. Because someone from kind of human psychology background, whenever we're working with anyone who's experience the world <laughs> because anyone who's experienced the world will have had some kind of trauma be it a micro trauma or a major trauma all of us have had some kind of negative experiences in life and in order to kind of heal that from that process those move forward and kind of enjoy life as much as you can those three things are the things that we need so we need to be able to feel safe in our world so that we can kind of move through it make decisions feel in control of our own actions all of those great things we need to be able to feel a sense of freedom because otherwise if you feel constantly trapped what's the response to feeling trapped well we we try and break free so you might see in both people and in dogs kind of behaviors in quote marks that we don't like so things like in a human shouting screaming in a dog barking and crying <laughs> because we're feeling trapped in the situation that we're in and then lastly connection because if we don't have connection with other people as humans and with dogs between dogs and people there's it's very hard to build a relationship it's very hard to to get to listen to each other, to listen to what the dog's telling us and for the dog to be able to listen to things that we're asking them to do. So it just felt like the three real fundamental pieces that we could really appreciate doing a deep dive on to really help people to understand their dogs a little bit better. One thing that really came through, wasn't it, is that the kind of careful balancing act between those three principles, you know, mm. the notion of freedom isn't actually do what you like when you like, when you feel like it because there are other things we have to think about about connection connection to other societal connections connections to uh you know the responsibilities around us safety being safe being safe for ourselves and recognizing our responsibility to keep others safe so actually there's on their own they they, they seem to be um obvious thing but when you put the three together you recognize wow there's, there's almost that bit in the middle that overlaps all those three things that we need to explore more uh, so I think what would be good um, is to kind of go through the, the each, each kind of uh, principle, really, each topic and, and just have a discussion generally about some of the thoughts that we had um, and just touch on some bits and pieces. As I said at the top of the, the chat, we can't deep dive, I haven't got enough time to deep dive this because we filled, got, we, so we filled probably six hours already with the workshops all in all and we still haven't done the final one yet. We haven't done connection yet as part of that workshops we were doing one each month and isn't it crazy how it actually makes you realize how fast time goes because i'm thinking wow it's been three months and i've got three months yeah. uh, it's crazy isn't it? so uh so safety was the first one so so laura um this was really interesting how you approach safety with your how you came at it and this is what's so special about these kind of collaborative workshops because you have something as simple as a word that we then push through our individual filters and our own thoughts and our own experiences and see what we came up with. And there's a lot of stuff that we came up with that was similar, but a lot of stuff that was very different. And I think that was the magic of that space, really. And, and that's the feedback we've 
had from the attendees of the workshops, of course, because, um, uh, yeah, so Laura, yeah, let's think, let's start off with safety and, and you can kick us well, off. Well, I, so I, I just, I want to start with a more general comment. And as you know, Holly and um, what you are just saying now, Andy, about it, it's always in, in flux, balancing these, um, you know, I, I think the larger political world and our political leaders could learn a lot by taking our workshops, right? And, and move, movements, uh, because that exactly what you two have been describing is what is not happening out oh. in the larger world of cultural political discourse just look at the rhetoric around mass. My freedom, freedom is a big word, right? You're impinging on my freedom not to wear a mask, right? And that's making it into an absolute, assuming you have no connection to anyone else, no relationship, no responsibilities. No, I, I mean, it's just mind boggling. So I actually think, um, you know, uh, any politician would do really well to take our three <laughs> workshop series. They would learn a lot. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. I'll get, I'll get <laughs> the invite sorted out after the chat, Laura. Yeah, let's pitch it to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so safety. Um, I This was my favorite right? This was my favorite because nobody talks about it in the way that we did. Nobody talks about it. Usually when you talk about safety, it's wearing muzzles. It's, um, you, you know, it's the external trappings of safety, putting up baby gates, management, all that kind of stuff. My take on it was, um, Safety is an embodied and felt experience. I, I really, um, on Saturday, I'm doing my <laughs> big trauma and aggression in dogs workshop. And a big part of that is what I'm calling deep safety, deep safety. And that's actually, I think, the, the the only way to go, deep safety is felt, it's embodied. It has an, a strong neurobiological component. You may intellectually believe you're safe, but there are many ways in which your body is continuing to tell you, no, your life is in danger. Um, mm. and, and that happens to our dogs all the time. Dogs who continually bark, lunge, and growl at every dog they see on leash. Um, most of that, by you know, by the time it's become that deeply habitual, is autonomic. It's what I call a neuroception of danger. That threat detection system on overdrive. That's not just a conscious state. That is an autonomic, sympathetic nervous system run amok. Um, and, and so I think we, we have to be thinking in all those terms. And of course, that moves us beyond the operant, to use your term, Andy, because uh, if a lot of this is our autonomic systems driving this threat detection, um, it, it, just offering a treat, not going to cut it. <laughs> you, you, you have to be thinking outside the operant box. You have to be addressing those deep-seated emotions. You have to be taking seriously the neurobiology of safety. Um, so that, that was basically my, my approach. That was really um, interesting. You mentioned about the people's other perceptions because um, with mine I, I did this uh, kind of straw poll of uh, people that were um, through through uh, one of the um, one of the, the avenues I have to kind of canvas people there's 350 dog owners canvas and there's 182 replied and uh, they were all saying things that were 
physical manifestations of safety, you know, mm -hmm. enclosed garden. Um, uh, it was interesting, 61%, which is really high, believe that actually training and obedience was the most important thing when we think about having safety. Uh, and there was a theme, wasn't there, that kind of came through that about what we were pushing against, which was this notion of how we can risk projecting our ideal of safety, freedom, connection onto another, uh, which might actually bear witness. And that's what you're referring to there, Laura, of course, because um, you know, that, that kind of concept of relief mm -hmm. is everything. Uh, is that animal actually feeling relief for those, that kind of uh, neuropathic experience that they're having, or are we just getting them to do something else instead? Or are we just suppressing the barking, lunging, but but the deep emotions and the autonomic system are unchanged? Yeah, I and I think that's a huge one. And this is what's really important with your work, of course, Laura. This is your important contribution to this bigger story that we're all trying to unravel, really, about how we truly support the emotional care and support needs of those dogs and the caregivers, of course. This, this notion of giving the opportunity for um, a real uh, integral shift in that dog's thought process that has value to them, that has actually has the option of helping them to self-regulate, but your cognitive reappraisal, if you like. Uh, it's just when we think about safety, especially that's important, isn't it? It's a really important part of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you just drawing on there as well Andy about the caregiver is so so important because often in trying to suppress the dog's behavior we're trying to make ourselves feel safer so we feel under threat either social threat embarrassed or even possibly physical threat if our dog's barking and lunging and we feel like we can't hold on to them or something like that and so in an attempt to make ourselves feel safer we try and shut down essentially the emotional experience of the dog um and that's it's not deliberate it's not something that i think has malice for the most part it is just again our body is just reacting and we're just doing what we can to make ourselves feel better so instead of kind of thinking of ourselves as so very separate from our dogs it can be helpful to be like you know what actually we're experiencing some of the same stuff here um mm -hmm. so what do we need to do to make ourselves feel safe so that we can then be in a position to help our dogs feel safer as well i think that's a really important point too um, well, yeah, because I did my, I focused in on social safety. I'll, I'll come on to that in, in a moment. But um, Holly, um, your interpretation of uh, this was really interesting. I should share it with us about how you, how you took up these strands for safety, um, especially for thinking about the caregivers. Yeah, so I think for me, I think a really important part is thinking about how we manage feeling overwhelmed and this is something that I talk about a lot um, and it definitely plays into a lot of what Laura was touching on as well but those feelings of overwhelm it's a similar kind of nervous system response so our body is saying you are at threat of death right now <laughs> <laughs> um, which is why it feels so incredibly intense and just all-consuming um, and it's so funny because often we can look back through rose-tinted glasses like an hour later a day later a week we think oh my gosh why did I get so wound up by that why was I so stressed um or we could explain it to someone else and think oh god this sounds a bit like <laughs> I'm making a big deal out of this but in that moment it is everything um so I often talk to people about being proactive rather than reactive um, and it's not always possible sometimes you just find yourself in the situation and then you've got to have some skills in your toolkit to get you and your dog out of there whatever that situation might look like for the two of you but if you can do as much as you can to really be proactive so that you are helping yourself <laughs> I think that can be really helpful because otherwise what happens is we have lots of the same situation happening over and over our bodies having that really kind of stressful response again and again both for us and for our dogs and we get stuck in this constant cycle and then you've got the guilt and all the negative emotions that go with that so it starts this whole big snowball starts rolling down the hill so almost little things that we can inject in to stop ourselves along the way I think can be really really helpful and that's going to look different for every person and every dog which goes back to what you were saying a minute ago Andy about how 
when we're thinking about creating safety with our dogs, actually, it's not on us to decide what makes that dog feel safe. Just because I've decided your crate should be your safe space, that might not be safe for you. Like your crate might be in a high traffic area in the middle of the house with loads of people walking past and that might be really stimulating. That's just one example. But yeah, we kind of want to do as much as we can to make safety feel intrinsic to that human or that dog rather than just a generic one size fits all your bed is your safe space get on it <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. thing so I think that's quite important mm -hmm. that's really powerful isn't it because what you're saying there is you can be safe but not feel safe the two things so we might think so I had a client whose dog kept trying to get out of the garden and they just kept building the wall higher and putting the fence higher um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I had to kind of break it and this is a, a new dog an adopted dog a dog from abroad that come over and been there along but uh, they felt that, that having that secure garden now made it safe well it, that the dog was now safe physically but the dog didn't feel safe that's why the uh, escape behaviors were coming so that's really powerful Holly and I think that's Really important for us to think about that. The, the wonderful Rachel Leather in her talks about trauma reminds us that you can't train safety. You have to feel it. And I think that's a very humbling reminder for, dog, for us dog trainers, really, about the things that we think we're creating through training and putting these narratives on there. Oh, let's see, the dog's calmer now, or the dog's this, or the dog's that. Whereas, in fact, sometimes, not always I know, it could just be an ex um, more of a representation that that dog's being more compliant. Or that that dog feels they don't have the, the choices that they might have doesn't necessarily mean they feel any safer. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so that brings on to my, I, I looked at social safety and um, both from the dog and the, the caregiver's point of view, and that touches on what you were saying, um, Holly, because uh, uh, Laura and I, we've done some collaborative work before when, with our re-envisaging reactivity workshop. Uh, and the big thing I focused in on was how we have to separate social processing and in other words, social threat evaluation, if you like, and social engagement preferences, uh, because we have to separate the two. It's pretty obvious when you think about it, because it's the same for us. I might want to have a look at something and work stuff out, but that doesn't mean I necessarily want to engage with that situation. And we can all think about situations like that. Uh, but for the caregiver, so I looked at that, uh, you know, about learning more about dogs from a to help them to feel safe by working out what their social processing preferences might be and what their social engagement preferences might be. And we went into a bit about that. But for the caregiver point of view, and you, you touched on this, Holly, which is really important, this notion of social evaluative threat, uh, that our brain is, uh, when we look at the kind of principles behind the theories of social evaluative threat, SET, uh, that we really fear judgment, the judgment of others is designed to make us feel it's supposed to be painful and and those studies that have been done relatively recently looking at those parts of the brain that seem to fire up with those senses of judgment are very similar to the parts of the brain that fire up with physical pain so, it's, so it hurts and it also starts to affect our ability to do any kind of um kind of mindful cognition to actually be able to process to be able to do some things and that's important for us to remember as trainers because we're, we're saying to our care to the caregivers to our clients right do this, do that, do the other. But if that fear of judgment of others, it's really at play in their mind and we're not giving them, equipping them with extra coping strategies to deal with navigating that, it's very unlikely they're gonna be able to do the work that we need them to do to support their dog. And then we wonder why they don't do it. And we wonder why they might come back to us then and say, actually, I didn't do that. I'm still finding myself avoiding, doing a lot of avoidance stuff. And we're like, hmm, you know, but in fact, that's why, because it's hard, it's painful. To put yourself in situations oh. where you know, there's that thing about that side of safety, feeling safe to even support another. Uh, you know, there's been so many stories and so many things that you see where a situation happens and people withdraw. Some people will go towards, they're like, sorry, I don't care what's way anybody else say, I'm going to help this individual. But many people would withdraw because that's kind of what our bodies want us to do, right? That's what our brain wants us to do a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. So it's so many kind of self-protection mechanisms at play. 
and most of them are in the subconscious so we're just not even aware of them and it can take people years of intensive therapy in some cases to identify the patterns what are the things I keep doing in reaction to stuff and even when we've identified it it then takes even more time to be able to stop it in its tracks so we're just um we are like little little robots sometimes our programming is so kind of ingrained that it takes workshops like these I think to really kind of like chip away at the narrative that society has and say actually you know it doesn't have to be like this we can think about it a little bit differently which I, I think is what we're trying to do here really yeah Laura any thoughts on that well I mean uh I freedom Safety, freedom, connection, meaning relationship. I mean, it's the meaning of life, right? What, what's the meaning of life? Without those three things, hard to have a meaningful life, whether you're a human or a dog or a horse or my African gray parrot parked right outside the door there, who's probably going to chime in uh, <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I, I just think uh, ch chipping away at the narratives, I mean, uh, uh, freedom, for example, the narrative of freedom. Um, I think our take on free, it seems like when, when people think of freedom, and this is where your little, um, your small, but I think really revealing, <laughs> um uh poll you know about what people actually think about this stuff they think in in terms of two uh two extremes one is uh freedom means absolute that that is i'm free to do anything or in terms of dogs you know my dog is a village dog not a household dog and then the other extreme is captivity right, in a shelter, in a household. And uh, yes, I, I recognize that. But again, I think freedom, um, freedom never occurs in a vacuum. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, I, I remember um, I'm on the advocacy panel of the Pet Professional Guild, and we had a session on dogs outside. Right. And so, of course, it was brought up, well, dogs should be free to run and not be on leash. And well, where I live, that is never going to happen. <laughs> that is just not possible, not going to happen. So what does freedom mean in that context? Well, my my approach was to rewrite the um, the five rules of freedom. <laughs> I, I think it's time for a huge updating. Um, freedom to love and be loved, right? Free, I mean, which has all kinds of implications for humans too. But for a dog, freedom to love and be loved, freedom to, and it, of course, this brings in part three relationship, but um, it means that our dogs have agency. That, that is one freedom, you know, a freedom to be who you, who you are. So a huge sense of freedom is not trying to make, for example, a Great Pyrenees or, a, a, you know, a, um, a livestock guarding dog into a household pet who has to be in a crate eight hours a day. Uh, no. That, that is actually a sense of freedom that, that is pretty close to abusive captivity. Um, and, and so part of our role as a caretaker has to be, yes, I want to be free to enjoy my dog. And honestly, all the complaints I hear are, I can't be free to enjoy my dog. Um, because of my dog, I can't do a laundry. In fact, I just got an email last night because of my dog. I can't read to my kids. I can't sit down and watch TV. I can't, 
you know, is that really true? I, I don't know, but clearly the person feels this is an emotional truth for them. I'm not free. Um, so imagine how our dogs feel most of the time. Uh, even freedom to sniff uh, is usually really truncated because the dog is on our schedule. Um, but, but I come back to two bottom line freedoms of uh, and, and one of them is something I really don't like to do, but it's like the freedom not to be. I have the freedom or maybe the right not to be an extension of your psyche. Mm. That's one. If I'm a, because dogs have occupied that place, especially in the last 20 years. Uh, therapy dogs, emotional support dogs, dogs as a, as a stand-in for family. And of course, they, they fill all those functions. We love our dogs like family. Um, but in what ways does that obscure how they need to grow, how we need to help them realize who they are? Um, you know, my, my big experience in this was my first border collie um, was having a lot of behavior issues. And someone told me, someone I trusted said, you should take that dog hurting because a light bulb is going to go off and the dog is going to say, oh, yeah, this is who I am. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? It happened. Uh, and after that, Actually, it was so much easier to um, really find a way to live together uh, and, and both of us flourish, right? Um, so my, my freedoms would be freedom to love and be loved, freedom to um, have a canine <laughs> sense of agency, which would include sniffing. Um, it would include uh, the things that dogs do, not just us, that we think dogs do that makes them feel better and free, like take them to the dog park and let them run off leash. No, uh, but maybe a more genuine sense of understanding um, what living in a household as a non-captive might mean for our dogs. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on. Oh, but. I think it's really, <clears throat> you know, just hearing you talking, this is a reflection even on our relationships with our, with our loved ones, right? I think, uh, oh yeah, you know, these things come in and I think, um, you know, uh, we've heard some very powerful kind of um, education given in the group with, with people like Maya Rose talking about kind of domestic abuse and, and what it is to be in relationships where you don't feel safe or there are no set freedoms to be self or there is no sense of connection that is, in, that is nourishing and, and supportive. And uh, this notion of I love you, when I, when I see it, especially in relation to when people say it in relation to their dogs, we have to recognize that for some people that notion of I love you is about I love you as long as you act like this yeah. or, I, or I love our relationship if it is this mm -hmm. rather than I genuinely love you and those kind of things and, and again looking at the little straw poll idea to say there's 182 people replied so it's quite, you know it was a reasonable data set uh, I guess um, uh, when again I was looking at freedom when I asked that question about freedom, it was very physical freedom that people talked about, safe off leash time, well-trained, having a garden, having the run of the house, choosing where they sleep, you know. Uh, and also when I asked the question about what does freedom for you mean regarding the ownership of a dog? Again, it was very physical, but this time it gave us a nod to the alignment between the physical and the emotional, because they were saying things like to be able to go anywhere with their dog, to be able to leave their dog at home uh, without there being any issues, to be able to get dog care for holidays and trips away from home uh, and to do fun activities with the dog as part of their lifestyle choices. So these are physical manifestations of freedom again, but actually about stuff that isn't gonna be 
need to for them to compromise on what their own version of freedom is. Uh, and there's a huge amount of compromise when we think about freedom. There just is societally. Um, and uh, like you said uh, earlier, Laura, having absolutist views on some of these things starts to become problematic when we think about mm -hmm. wider concepts around social cohesion and, um, and the ability to coexist, I think. Absolutely. Um, w with my freedom, really, I focused in on um, looking at it from a philosophical point of view, looking at the kind of almost the, the emancipation of dogs, really, uh, away from this stuff. And it, and it kind of took kind of underpin it all. It was about this notion of freeing ourselves. And this is a big message for us. I, 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 um, uh, I hosted for Brissa Stewart in her school yesterday with, um, with Dr. Laurie talking about boundaries. And again, uh, this, this big topic, which a lot of this stuff's about when we think about this paradigm shift, if you want to call it that, that we're looking at with our relationship with dogs, but also looking at ourselves, it's about finding ways to unshackle ourselves from the judgments and expectations of others. That's another form of freedom, really. It's, uh, that isn't about physical freedom. It's just about, I won't have my story written by somebody else. And that's kind of what happens for so many dogs. It's the expectations and judgments of the human which dictates what their behavior should or shouldn't be. And that becomes problematic. And, and we discussed at the, the workshop about how that notion, that good to bad continuum that is designed and monitored and arbitrated by another has created the uh, issues for children, for women, for minorities, for all sorts of different areas. And, and that we've ended up with almost that dogs should be seen or not heard mm -hmm. without meaning to kind of end up down that route. So uh, I think we all ended up diving into quite a philosophical view on freedoms. Uh, Holly, um, yours especially was looking at things from, from quite a philosophical angle here with freedom. Mm, yeah, so I, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but I was thinking kind of specifically about intergenerational trauma and dogs being free from shackles of that so I suppose when we think about intergen intergenerational trauma we're thinking about trauma and the effects of trauma that get passed down from generation to generation um, and this is something that could be huge kind of um, world events or countrywide events that happen or they could just be patterns that consist and persist through generations of families um, so it kind of makes sense to me that if you are a person who has a pattern of for example being very quick to be frustrated with someone when you feel like you aren't being listened to or your needs aren't being met that you um, immediately go on the attack so some of us would attack ourselves some of us would attack in quote marks another person um so if you're always being quite irritable with your partner for example or your colleagues you're immediately someone that's just quick to anger then if your dog also puts you in the position or you perceive that they put you in the position where they're not listening to you, you're asking them to do something that they know how to do it. I know he knows how to do that, but he won't do it. He's not listening. And then immediately we have that quick reaction towards our dogs as well. So maybe the harsh tones or the get on your bed or, you know, in some cases it could be more extreme. It could be the tap on the nose or something more serious than that. But for me, it doesn't always have to be physical to be damaging. I think emotional um, kind of persistent emotional abuse is just as damaging, if not more in some cases. Um, and dogs are all different, just like we are. So if someone said something to you and I, Andy, like maybe I would take offense and you wouldn't or vice versa. We've all got our different thresholds for things um, and dogs are the same. So often you'll hear dog, dogs being referred to as being more sensitive. I don't think it's necessarily that. It's just that we've all got different personalities and we've all got a different history. So it's just being very, very aware of the patterns that we have and the reactions that we do very quickly and just thinking, am I doing that with my dog as well? And if I am, what do I need to change about myself in order to stop doing that to my dog? Because they don't deserve it at the end of the day. They deserve to be free from that intergenerational trauma. So that was kind of the take that I had on it really. And that's really powerful, isn't it? And especially, you know, how, how passed on a lot of this stuff is, um, both directly 
which is kind of easier to uh, to frame sometimes, but often indirectly, um, how much it kind of formulates those responses and those filters. And, you know, we discussed in the workshop, perception is everything, right? Uh, I think that this is the thing. And um, this comes back to, to your work, Laura, you know, this notion of reappraisal, take uh, reevaluating and stepping back and looking and considering these things for all of us is hard, mm -hmm. but really important because otherwise the, we have a runaway train of combined trauma and, uh, and quick thinking brains and nervous system responses. And, mm -hmm. and I think uh, our society is kind of showing that, especially since everything's so fast nowadays and, uh, and, and we can have that runaway train that gets directed to our, our animals without even them being aware of it. Yeah, I, I think that that's true. Um, and I actually, I, I totally agree, Holly, when you said um, emotional, <laughs> um, uh, you know, not even emotional abuse, but dogs are usually incredibly sensitive to our tone of voice. And, and that is why, for example, and this is again where the process of neuroception becomes so important. There's an autonomic piece to it, and then there's the conscious piece to it. Um, you know, as mammals, we we form relationships kind of moving into the our final workshop um by by seeking safe connections right and how do we know safe connections is it what people say well yeah kind of but even more it's their facial expressions it is what uh what some uh, have called a prosody, that is the vocal intonations of safety. That's the difference between, um, you know, a, oh, good boy, kind of in a musical sing song and, hey, <laughs> you know, a har harsh tone um, because actually dogs like humans process tone much faster then they do the actual meaning of a word. So before you've even said anything, the dog has learned to, okay, I either need to be on defensive from the tone or, oh, this is gonna be something good. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think there are so many aspects of um, both freedom and relationship uh and if you you know talking about intergenerational trauma if you've grown up in a family where all you heard as a young child you know from your earliest days was hey do this do that do you know really kind of the authoritarian harsh tone or or even just disapproving tone uh, that gets passed on to our dogs and I think dogs uh, often with uh, without our even being aware of it one thing I have done not in every client session um, but I've made people record themselves talking to their dog I mean like and we've done it you know in sessions but I I just Hear, hear yourself when you are talking to your dog. When you're saying, and that's the problem with using some of these terms, right? No. Can you say no in a kind way, in a safe way? Not really. Uh, or, and that, that is another reason I don't use cues like drop it, uh -huh. <laughs> leave it. Because even when you you have good intentions, they sound like threats, and the unsaid of that is or else, right? Yeah. And that that comes through in our intonation. You could say eat it, and the dog, 
and the dog would feel like, oh man. Um, so I, I think actually some of this connects all three, feeling of safety, um, leading to freedom, to love and be loved. Well, it, to, to love and be loved, you've got to feel safe in that connection. And both of those lead to having meaningful relationships. Um, I, I just think the models we've been given for understanding these issues in our dogs are completely inadequate. They are completely inadequate. They are not, and they're not helping us, right? Uh, yeah. that, that is my overwhelming feeling, but it's hard for people to um, step outside the box, the box says. Mm. And it's hard for people to admit, to hold their hands up and say, you know what? I think I messed up a little bit there. I had um, a lovely example of this the other month. A lady that I'm working with sent me a video. So her dog had taken a gardening glove off of the table in the garden, was joyfully running around with it, and then <laughs> started trying to rip it up. And so she wants to take it back from him. And her, her initial response was, drop it in that tone. And then she caught herself and said, can I have that please? And he immediately let go. Now, I'm not saying every dog would do that, but she said, it's just so interesting how all I did was change my tone, try mm -hmm. and soften my body language a little bit. And I got that positive response. And again, that may not happen in every situation, but it takes a lot for someone to be able to say, you know what, whoopsie, I need to try better next time. And that's all we can ever do. It's not about being perfect. It's just trying to be better. I think that's the message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. that trying trying to be better. I think that I think that's what it's about. And I think you know one thing that you and I know from our um, time doing uh, you know, therapy for others is, is recognizing the importance of us turning up to any kind of session and making sure ensuring we're in as better regulated state as possible ourselves, so that we can be available to that. Uh, and that's tough, right? Because of all the stuff that happens on. And listen to you talking, Laura. One thing that I thought about, I just wrote it down here actually is. One of the things we want to give our dogs freedom from as well uh, is freedom from our dysfunction. <laughs> yeah, uh, because we're, because um, amen. Yeah, because if you think about how often, especially for a dog who's just got used to being having people shout at it all the time, even if that's more of a reflection of the keg of the stress and all the other mm -hmm. things that are going on in their lives. Um, like the wonderful Maya talked about when, when talking about domestic abuse and, and things like that, when that part of the brain is almost waiting, is this going to be a good response? Is this going to be a bad response? How am I going to feel about that? That must have a, an ongoing influence on that nervous system, I think. And, uh, and we just have to be mindful of it, mm -hmm. uh, I think. Uh, and I loved in your talk, um, Laura, because you were, you were talking about the difference between freedom from stuff Mm -hmm. But you put, you focus more on the freedom to, and to yeah. really celebrate the freedom to do stuff, yeah. uh, because that is real agency there, isn't it? I think that's the key, rather than waiting for somebody else to give you the freedom from something else. Yeah, because, the, you know, freedom from is important. It's not that it's not important, but basically... Um, freedom comes from your ability, whether you're a dog or a human, to really um, realize and actualize uh, who you are. Who are you? And, and I totally agree with Holly. Dogs have different personalities. That's actually hard for people to understand, right? Because I've had 10 German Shepherds before. Mm -hmm. I've had 10. And this one is just totally different. Yeah, because different personality, different individual, different dog. Yes, there are some um, hardwired characteristics. But, you know, my, my, uh, my basic role in our partnership, because that's my model for dog human relationship is to help my partner uh, become who they were meant to be as much as I can. Yeah. You know, so with my border collie, 
it was a fine, you know, trying to learn more <laughs> about what her needs were, but um, actually I did go out and buy a, I did, that is when I got my first flock of sheep, which expanded to like 30 head and I did lambing and all, all because of her, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I still have my sheep, but it, it's a much reduced flock. I don't do competitive herding anymore, but, but I think I was even back then at the beginning, I was willing to at least go find someone, um, who could enable this part of what seemed to be so important for my dog. And give her an, a, an, a really fulfilling outlet for it. Oh, I'm a herding dog. You could see that light bulb go off. That's why with a, with a hunting dog, well, with any dog, but especially scent, you know, scent driven dogs, you've got to enable a really robust sniffing program for them, give them outlets for that. And I, I think, um, and then there's the emotional uh, part of it and the cognitive part of it. Uh, so actually, I think what we're seeing is um, really all three of these things exist in constant tension with each other. And the more we know about them, the, the better relationships we will be able to have with our dogs. Um, and I know we're, we're having our final relationship workshop next week. Remind me, what, what day is it actually? What day are we doing? It's the last day of the month, I believe. Not sure what day okay. that is. Off the yeah. yeah, the 31st uh, is. Yeah. yeah, the 31st. That, that's on connection, isn't it? That's the kind of um, <laughs> that's the word. And I think... Um, this is why I think these discussions are really important because people talk about having a connection, having a bond, uh, having a healthy relationship. What does that mean? What does it mean yeah. in terms of safety and freedom? What does it mean in terms of being able to communicate? Uh, going back to the boundaries uh, Q and A I did in Grisha Stewart School last night with Dr. Laurie. Uh, somebody asked about um, how do they look at setting some healthy boundaries with their partner without upsetting and. Dr. Laurie said about, well, how often do we actually talk to our partners about what their needs might be? Or, uh, you know, and I think that's a really important thing because, because uh, that can change over time, of course, especially if you've been in a long-term relationship. And, uh, and uh, so I think connection for me, you said earlier that safety, that um, safety was your favorite word, topic. Uh, for me, I think connection is, oh, we've lost Holly. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, hopefully Holly will come back in. I know Holly's got an issue with, uh, has a bit, been up and down with her. Um, Zoom. Yeah, with her Zoom and also with her connection. So hopefully yeah. Holly will come back in in, in a moment. But uh, yeah, connection for me, you know, uh, it was interesting because when we first started talking about it, I said to you, Laura, that that was the one I was struggling with. Oh, here we go, he's Holly, brilliant. Hi, Holly. Hey. Hey, Holly. Hey. Sorry. Got kicked out for a second. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't me, honest. Uh, yeah, but I was just saying, uh, for me, connection is the one. That initially, I thought, well, I'm, I'm, uh, that's a bit of a tricky one. But then I thought, hang on, that's, what I, that's my whole thing, really. When I think about my cake, mm -hmm. uh, kind of acronym, really, and about what, uh, trying to be more available to the emotional truth of another, that there is this element of allowing others to feel heard as part of that process. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and... To, to look at being able to, to be available and to turn up, I think for yeah, us. Yeah. Um, uh, and that does take, especially when in relationships that have been either going for a long time, or especially if we don't understand the dynamic of that relationship. And I think a lot of caregivers with their dogs, instinctively they probably do, but because again of the expectations and judgments of others, because of the stuff that's on the telly, because of this big, kind of real emphasis over the last 20, 30 years on obedience, it's created a bit of a wedge between their, uh, their perception of connection and what the dog especially is really looking for, for connection. Well, I, I totally agree. 
And uh, I, I don't want to give too much away because I want people to tune in next week. But, but my, my whole um, uh, take on relationship is, is going to be people. And this, this is a, a great kind of connection between what you were just saying, Andy. People think that the answer, for example, to adolescent uh, um, uh, hyperactivity, hyperarousal, getting into trouble is obedience, you know, impulse control, obedience. No, it's actually relationship. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about a, a study that has just recently been released um, that dogs uh, and, and actually this works for teenagers too, dogs who had really healthy, stable, caring relationships had many fewer behavior issues than, um, than adolescent dogs who didn't. Much, you know, obedience didn't really get them anywhere. Um, and oh. also I'm going to talk about relationship and trauma because the best thing you can do for your you know, overseas meat farm dog that you've just adopted or a dog from in our, in here in the US brought up from down south or any dog who's been traumatized is not obedience. <laughs> it's not that kind of training. It is surrounding them with supportive, healthy, nurturing relationship, both with other dogs and with humans, because we're part of their, their um, family unit. Um, so I, I think this is actually quite going to be quite revealing to many people, because if you have a dog with behavior issues, the first thing people do is um, go to behavioral control. You know, my dog is doing blank. I'm going to go to behavioral control. We know with trauma survivors, that is one of the worst things you can do. Or, mm -hmm. or maybe a better way to put it is one of the most ineffective. We right? see that a lot with, with children, of course, because they will have experienced trauma of, of various, you know, whatever that trauma might be. The behavior presentation then is deemed as being disruptive or being you know, yeah. challenging or whatever, then they're put into various boxes and treated in various they're ways. They're put into time out. Time out, yeah. Uh -huh. And even, even the kind of you know, gold star on the board thing, what, it, what is that doing though regarding, yeah. is there still any outlet for that child to communicate emotional need and especially to communicate self around trauma so in fact we end up re-traumatizing and, and I'm, I'm sure you holly i know myself when I, I when i was involved in the human side of things that was a recurring theme of people in adulthood that yeah. uh, you know th there was just a, a cul-de-sac given uh and that was no, no other routes were available for them to navigate through so a lot of coping strategies which were potentially not even appropriate when they were children but definitely not when they're adults and, and it becomes really problematic and I think we're doing the same with dogs often. Yeah, yeah. And it is really that one size fits all. If you have this behavioural problem, then you need to do this, this and this. Um, and I can really frustrate people sometimes, I think, <laughs> because they say to me, what are the, the three, four or five training exercises? I'll do them every day. Just tell me what to do and I'll do mm -hmm. it. And I say, well, we need to understand where your dog's coming from before we can even start to think of what to do. We need to make them feel safe. <laughs> mm -hmm. We need to give them some freedoms and then we need to build your connection. And then from there, usually things start to feel easier on their own, not fixed, not, you know, that's a problematic word at the best of times, but things start to feel more manageable. And then we can think about what little bits to add in if we want to. But just like you were saying, Laura, it's not a case of, this is my behavioral issue. This is the exercise I do five times a day for a week and then everything's solved because we are living emotional beings and we just don't work like that. Mm. So yeah, it's um it can be really tricky because 
but there's always going to be that that one person that says oh I did this and it fixed all of my problems but I think that it's just so short-sighted because often so many people are so unaware of what their dog is trying to communicate to them so yes you may have shut down the barking at the the tv but it is coming out in another way and your dog is suffering usually mm. um so I think that's the bit that gets missed a lot of the time definitely um I'm actually going to be concentrating on how to rebuild connection in my part of the workshop the next workshop um because I think that's really crucial because mm -hmm. there will be times when it does go wrong um, and then we think right what do we need to do for this individual dog to rebuild things and make them feel safe with us again um, and that could be a dog that's coming to you that you haven't had since teeny tiny or it could be that you have had them since eight weeks but some things have just gone a little bit wrong along the way so yeah that's what I'm going to be focusing on I think oh, that Great. is just gold on its own Holly and I think this is really important because when we think about rebuilding connections, again, we're looking back at the notions of safety and freedom and all these other aspects regarding the individual in front of us, not necessarily what we project from ourselves regarding that. And, uh, you know, um, I, I'm giving a talk at ADCH here in the UK in, in I think it's October, and which is the, the kind of uh, association for, for rescue centers or shelters, if, if you're from uh, one of our, friends uh, in the States um, and my talk is actually about looking at shifting from a emphasis on making dogs adoptable to actually uh, finding more balance with supporting caregivers with understanding that individual dogs care and support needs because uh, Quite often, I think, especially uh, when we think about the pressures on, on rescue to get, get animals out, um, we can just set people off on a very task oriented point of view because we're focused in on tasks of training. But it reminds me a little bit, you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, Holly, I think, um, you know, back in the days of human, uh, you know, um, fostering or adopting of, of children and, uh, you know, saying to little Johnny, look, if you don't stand up straight, if you don't behave, nobody will love you. Making, all, making the emphasis on the child to somehow be adoptable. Mm -hmm. We've shifted from yeah. that now. Now the onus is on the potential adopter to be aware of and show evidence that they can give the care and support that that child needs. And I, and I think these are all conversations that we have to have, not I just want to throw them because it, it's these conversations regarding these principles we're talking about today underpin a lot of these things and and you're right what you said earlier Laura the reality is as part of these discussions what we're work learning is some of the old perceived wisdoms within training and behavior just aren't fit for purpose actually now um, uh, and some of them uh, they need tweaking and they need rearranging and uh, I think that's why all these discussions are so amazing so we've come to the end of our hour which is amazing so, so it's gone by pretty quick um uh and i'm hoping that people listening um have had a flavor of why these collaborations are just so cool and and so powerful so the actual workshop has uh, it's a couple of hours on each topic with us kind of deep diving we have each of us has our own little presentation and then the real kind of power of those workshops is when we discuss stuff like we are now and, and really kind of unpick uh, and uh, we did very little uh, show and tell ahead of the workshops we had a rough idea of what each of us was talking about but we almost kind of watched each other's presentations live and raw mm -hmm. and it really added to that thing of what does that do now what what sparks that fly so uh, if anybody's interested in really deep diving on these three things uh, the workshop can be still accessed we haven't done the connection one yet so we're just giving some teasers for that uh, uh, you can uh, get that all three all three uh, uh, either you can pay the full price or I, I think there's payment plans as well isn't the Holly in place there yeah, or you yeah, can buy them yeah. individually and of course you can buy one individually and if you like you can buy another one individually and just spread it out that way if you like but um we'll put some information in the in the uh in the time in the chat and also in the main group but just um just so people can know now where, where's the place to go holly for getting the um so it's www.pauseupdogs.com forward slash know you know your dog but i will i'll put the link in the chat so it's easy for people to find um and that will take you to the page where you've got all of those options so you can pick whatever works best for you 
Brilliant. Uh, any closing thoughts then, uh, Laura, before we say goodbye to everybody? Uh, uh, no, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, without, I mean, I, I consider myself to be a pretty humble person. I always try to keep learning from others, but I really strongly feel like people have a lot to learn from us. People have a lot to learn from us. And, and so I strongly recommend at least um, sampling some of the workshops, share this with your friends, uh, people who are struggling with their own dogs, or if you know professionals, share it with them. Because uh, I think this is something that people need to hear. I'm sending it to my local politicians for sure. For sure, I think. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's also nice, you know, uh, it's not very often you get uh, a shared space with three professionals who, uh, um, oh uh, yeah, who feel safe and have the freedom to talk. Uh, and I think, um, uh, and and we've got to move away a little bit from people just trying to claim a specific narrative. I, I think the, the we, we, we've kind of tried that and it hasn't quite worked. I think, I think the, the joy of this is the democratization of this. And, you know, all three of us have been so humbled and um, educated by the general public when they start offering their thoughts within our groups. You know, Doc said to care some of the best posts from caregivers. Uh, and so everybody has a voice in this. Everybody has something to contribute. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's what's so beautiful about having these kind of discussions, which isn't a case of it wasn't us three saying tonight, look, here's the thing. This is what you must do. It was a case of saying, mm -hmm. well, these are the questions we've got to ask. Uh, Holly, um, final words, darling. Yeah, and just sort of piggybacking off that, something that you said in the last workshop that has stuck with me was actually that it's, it's just questions. We're not serving up. A, a, a protocol we're not giving you a program to follow there's no step by step it's actually opening up even more questions but in doing that the conversations are just wonderful like I come I came away from the first and the second workshop feeling so like inspired and revved up and I just wanted to go and tell everybody <laughs> so I think that's that's the beauty of it and that's why I love collaborative work I think when you you can team up with other professionals and take so many different spins on one idea it's it's really amazing so yeah we'd really encourage people to come and come and check it out for sure and that's the thing we're, we're gonna uh, you know all of us I think you know when we heard each other talk um we were like wow uh, and then it makes you, you want to go back and redo your presentation then because you've got to wish I'd talked about that bit or that bit. And this is the beautiful thing about <laughs> yeah. it. Um, and it's very, uh, it's great to kind of, um, to have the generosity of working with you, Ty. I just think, uh, you know, I pinch myself sometimes with the wonderful people I get a chance to kind of work with and, and collaborate with. So thank you both for giving your time tonight and having a chat in the group, even tonight's chat, right? I think I'm hoping, looking at the comments mm -hmm. in the group, especially, I think it just gets people thinking and, and having that kind of space. Uh, so um, uh, just to let you know, and next chat in the live will be, what a great week, because we've had two amazing chats already with the wonderful Daniela Beck on Tuesday. We've got uh, my, my really good friend and uh, an inspiration, actually, I, you know, um, I'm very lucky to have her to kind of hold counsel with, uh, is Sandy Sharma. She's here on Saturday, 6 p.m. UK time. Uh, Sandy's amazing. I just love the way she talks about life and about how we connect and, and how we should try and do things from the heart. We're talking about connection. It's a good place to start, right? You know, that kind of heartfelt. And Sandy's also going to share with us a summit that she's put together along with uh, the, the wonderful Rachel Forday, uh, looking at um, uh, inclusivity and diversity uh, within the mm -hmm. dog community, as she said at the summit. Uh, so uh, that's on Saturday. And then uh, next Tuesday, uh, we've got Jay Miller, wonderful Jay Miller, uh, seven o'clock UK time in the group. Um, that's up in the events tab. Uh, and uh, yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, you two. Um, and I'll see you on the 31st, of course. And, um, and good night, everybody. Hope you have a good evening or a good morning Bye. or whatever time it is there. Bye. Take care. Bye.